Let's return then to our discussion of utilitarianism. Today we're going to focus especially on the theories of John Stuart Mill, but we'll also look at some other versions of this. Remember last time I was talking about different kinds of moral theory, and I said you might start with a question of character, with this question of what kind of person should I be, and try to define everything else in terms of that, as, for example, Aristotle seems to do. Or you could focus on motives, and think about motives as really fundamental, and this determining everything else. That's what on many interpretations, at least, Immanuel Kant does. We'll get to him later in the course. Then, a traditional way of looking at it is just to focus on the actions themselves, and to say things like murder is wrong, theft is wrong, and so forth, where you're focusing on the actions. Forget the motive, forget the kind of person who's doing it, forget the effect of it, it's just the type of action that it is that is of moral significance. And then you might look at effects, and that's what utilitarianism does. It says the value of actions and of states of character and of motives and so on depends on the effects of action. Now, the most natural way to do this is to go backwards and to say, well, as we talked about last time, the effects primarily are whether good or bad, effects on happiness, for example, improving happiness, or at least chances for happiness, or decreasing them. However, you might say, all right, just go back. A good action is one that tends to have good effects. A good motive is one that tends to lead to good actions. A good state of character is one that tends to lead to good motives, and so on. But of course, you don't have to do that. You could jump back and say, well, actually, yes, I'm judging things by the effects on actions. But actually, I am going to think primarily in terms of states of character. And the effects of honesty, or the effects of courage, the effects of states of character. And so you might then bypass some of those intermediate steps. That would be a way of being a utilitarian, a way of being a consequentialist, but not the standard way that Bentham and Mill represent. Or you could jump all the way back and talk about a good society as one that has good effects for its members, but then say, what is a good character? Well, the sort of person that fits into that society. So part of the reason I asked you to read the essay on con ethics uh, from Africa was that that's really the pattern. It is a utilitarian theory. It starts with consequences. But then, instead of going through actions and motives and states of character and people and ultimately to states of society and all communities, instead it jumps all the way back to the community and then traces things back. So it basically says, what is a good community? One that has, well, happy people in it. <laughs> One that has good effects on its members. But then we could say, what is it to have a good state of character? The kind of person who would fit into a good community. A good motive would be one that such a good person would have. A good action is one that such a good motive would be to. And so we don't have to do things just sort of in domino order in the way that is standardly done in Western philosophy. Now, what does Bentham's idea really come to? It's actually fairly complicated, and it is the foundation for, well, a cost-benefit analysis, for financial analysis, much of what they teach you in the business school actually comes out of Bentham. It's an economic sort of analysis of actions. And so here is what, the, what you're supposed to do. Think about a given person for an option. First of all, I guess I should say, identify the various options that are in front of you, and then say for each option, well, how is that going to affect various people? So suppose that A through Z here are the people who might be affected by your action. What you do is think, all right, person A, Let's evaluate the possible benefits for person A. And so that's in the line of pleasure, or sort of profit for A. And now that itself is a complicated calculation, because you may know exactly what this will do for person A, but you may not, right? It may be a question of probabilities. Maybe A will benefit a lot from this, maybe A won't. So suppose you're A, and you're in Las Vegas, and you go over to the roulette wheel, and you say, hmm, I think I'll play red. Well. You, in doing that, you might win, and so you might benefit, but you might lose your money. And so really you have to think, what is the probability of this payoff? And then, of course, you've got to go to the pain side. What is the probability that I will lose, and how much will I lose? And you perform a calculation in that way that gives you the difference. That is your expected gain or loss from this option. Okay? And that's just for person A. And notice it does involve probabilities. You're thinking about taking a risk. It might pay off. Yay, I have to think about the probability of the benefit. But then I also have to think about the probability of it not paying off and the possible value there and do a calculation and compute the expected value 
for each person now involved, I do that for A, for B, for C, and so on, all the way down to C, for all of the people who might be affected by my action. And then I add it all up. So this is what Bentham means by the moral or the philosophic calculus. It is a calculus, a way of calculating the expected effects of action. And we have to think about that when we're doing things like going to Las Vegas and thinking about playing blackjack or roulette and so on. We also have to think about it in ordinary life. I go to that restaurant. Ooh, maybe it'll be really good. Maybe it won't be. Okay, and so I have to think about the possible costs and the possible benefits, the probabilities of those, and figure out my expected value for me, but then for everybody else affected by the action. So I add all those things up. I get the total expected amount of pleasure that might be experienced as a result of this action, the total amount of loss that might be experienced. Then I take a balance of those. Okay, and so I get the net effect of the action as expected, given all the probabilities and so on. That's what I've got there as B. And then we do that for each option and compare those various Bs. That's where that scale comes from. The scale is about of comparing the outcomes there, the expected results of my action. But of course, and by the way, this is why Bentham and Mill talk about tendencies of actions. They don't say, just look at whether the action worked out well and judge the action on the basis of that. After all, there can be people who get lucky, right? They do something stupid that would normally be a very bad thing to do, but it works out well and actually benefits people. Or there are people who are unlucky. They do something that would normally be fine, but in this particular case, they're unlucky and the effect of the action is bad. So think of a case, yeah, like that. What is a case where you do something wrong, and yet, through sheer luck, it works out okay? <laughs> Maybe you're never lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Running a red light. Running a red light. Yes, good. Okay. You run a red light. You think, oh man, I'm really in a hurry. I don't see anybody around. You go through the red light. And you might think, that's a bad thing to do normally. But in this case, luckily, it works out. You don't hit anybody. Nobody catches you. It's okay, right? Um, now, in that case, do we say, oh, well, then it's fine to run red lights as long as nobody's around <laughs> and as long as you don't get caught? Uh, probably not. At least Bentham and Mill say, no, you got lucky in that case. But that doesn't mean it was a fine thing to do. Uh, there are all sorts of things like that, right? Where you do something wrong, but it works out okay, they don't get caught. And so you say, whew, yeah, you know, I, I realize that general murder is wrong, but at least I didn't get caught. Nobody cares about that dude anyway. <laughs> Um, no, that doesn't make it okay. You have to think about the general tendencies of the action, the expected value, and not just what happens to work out in that particular case. Yeah? Could you just better define the variables when they mean Oh, all right, yeah, define what do I mean? The people are just A, B, and so on through Z. So those just stand for people. What do I mean by P of A? That is the expected pleasure for A, okay? The expected benefit. A lot of people will tell you when you're making decisions, list up all the costs, list up all the benefits, or list the advantages and list the disadvantages. That's what Bentham's doing here. He's just attaching numbers to it. He's saying, okay, a P of A, P of C, and so on, that's the expected benefit, the expected advantages for A, the expected advantages for B. I use P just because, well, both pleasure and pain start with P, so I thought in terms of profit and loss, thinking about this sort of financial analogy so P of A is just the profit for person A. P of B, the profit for person B. And again, that's not a simple thing, typically, if we don't know the results of the action. That's going to be something we have to calculate using probabilities of various outcomes. L of A is the loss, the expected loss for A. L of B, the expected loss for B, and so on. So what I've got down at the bottom is just P. That's the expected profit, the expected benefit for everybody involved. L, the expected loss for everyone involved. And then if I subtract the loss from the, the profit, I get the balance, the net effect um, for everybody involved. So B of A, B of B, and so on is the net expected value for A. The net expected value for B. B itself is just the net expected value for everyone. Yeah. How all right, good. How do you attach a number to happiness? Okay, I think Bentham really thinks of it this way. 
Um, there's something neurophysiological happening inside your brain that is an indicator of your level of happiness. And so you might imagine that instead of this little thing on my belt, I have a pleasure on here. And it just has a little dot. Okay? And it, you know, it's like, oh, okay, professor told a good joke. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, it goes, it goes up a little toward the pleasure side. But then you start talking about quizzes, and you start thinking, oh, I have to make quizzes. It goes down, and so on. And you've got this little meter. And it, I think he really thinks it's like that in the brain. There are pleasure centers, there are pain centers, and we could, in theory, measure the activation of those, and that's where these numbers would come from. Now, in fact, it's a serious problem where those numbers can come from. And so, really, when we think about the scale, there are all sorts of issues we're going to have to face in doing this calculation. One of them is just this question of where we get these numbers from. How do we tell? In Vegas, it's not that hard. You know what the probabilities are, you know how, what the payoffs are, and so if you are actually gambling, then it's very clear, right? In some financial cases, it's clear what the outcomes are. But in a lot of cases, it's really not. You're thinking about eating a burrito. How much pleasure is involved in the burrito? Okay. Um, you think, well, it's a really good burrito, I'll enjoy it. I said, well, put a number on it. Is that like a plus 17? What is it? You know, how good is this burrito? We don't normally think that way, so already that's kind of weird. But also, we've got to make interpersonal comparisons, right? How do I know, even if I could do this myself, I could say, well, that burrito is awesome, that was worth a 17. That one was pretty good, that's only worth an 11, blah, blah, blah. Um, how could I compare my scale to yours? After all, here's, I mean, here's the background argument that both Bentham and Mill have for this. They're empiricists. They want to found ethics on something observable, on something you can perceive. And pleasures and pains are things you can perceive. But now, here's the problem. I can perceive my own pleasures and pains, but I can perceive yours. I can perceive their effects. I might see you smile or frown, but I don't actually have access to your mental state. So how do I compare my scale of pleasures and pains to yours? It's a serious problem, and there's a whole field of economics that tries to study these questions and examine how we do that. It's called welfare economics because it's trying to figure out how do we assess people's levels of welfare or well-being, and how do we put them together into some general guide about what ought to be done. So, I mean, here's the good news. Bentham's work here did lead to an entire field of economics. Here's the bad news. <laughs> it's really problematic in that field how we can compare one person's scale of pleasures and pains to another person's scale. But those are only some of the problems we're going to have. What about pleasures and pains themselves? Bentham thinks of this as all arranged on a single scale. And it's like the plus values are pleasures, the minus values are pains. But is it really like that? Are pleasure and pain just pluses and minuses on a single scale? Or are they different scales altogether? After, I, think, I mean, here's one way of thinking. Think about stepping into a hot, okay? And it's really quite hot. Uh, not so hot that you are solid and go, no! <laughs> but neither is it just the warm. I mean, it's like just the right temperature where you get it off the tub and it's like, ooh. Now, that's a pleasurable feeling, but it's also slightly painful, right? You've got to have the heat there so it's just slightly uncomfortable. And if you, I mean, if you can't, Call anything to mind with hot tubs. Think of just a bath or a shower. Uh, you know, what, what is the proper temperature for a shower? It's just hot enough that you feel a little tingly and it's slightly hot. At least that's what I think. <laughs> um, anyway, that's a weird mixture of pleasure and pain, right? And so is it really just a question of values on a single scale? Maybe not. Also, there's this question of how we compare near and long term pleasures. This is something Bentham is very much aware of. He says, do I prefer a pleasure now or a pleasure later? Well, all other things equal, I prefer that pleasure now. If I say, I'll give you a dollar right now, or I'll give it to you a year from now, which would you take? The dollar now, right? But now a year from now, well, if, I, well, what if it's two dollars a year from now? Now it's sort of harder to tell what to do. And so you might think, yeah, how do we figure out how to compare the near-term pleasures and the longer-term pleasures. The near-term pains, the longer-term pains. Uh, it's, in economics, the question of how do we establish a discount rate. And in moral calculus, too, there is something like a discount rate. Um, in finance, you're talking about the value of money. Well, here you can talk about the value of pleasures. <laughs> and you have to figure out how much more a pleasure now is than a pleasure a month from now or a year from now. And that's a hard thing to know how you could be right and wrong. 
there's also a problem of going from ordinal to cardinal scales. I might say, oh yeah, which of these restaurants do I like best? I like A, then B, then C, then D. But now if you say, well, how much more? Give me some idea of the intensities. Put those on a scale with numbers. That's a different thing, right? And that's much harder. So it's usually thought to be fairly easy to just write things. Oh, I, this is my number one choice. And this is number two. <laughs> this is number three, and so on. But to then say, aha, that was a 10, this one's only a 6, and this is a 1, that's a much harder thing. And finally, we've got this problem of different kinds of pleasures. So, actually, let's see here. Yeah. In thinking about the kinds of pleasures problem, I want to back up for a moment and just think in general about what the utilitarian is doing. We're trying to characterize what, for example, a good action is, or what obligation is what it is for something to be such that you ought to do it. Or if you want to think of it this way, just think of an action being right, an action being good. And then the utilitarian's giving you some kind of definition. Ah, uh, it bruises enough good, or it maximizes the good. Now, how is that as a definition? Remember when we were thinking about other kinds of things, we were thinking about, are there false negatives? Are there false positives? Are there times when something might even maximize your expected level of happiness for the whole community, and nevertheless be bad. Are there other cases where you might say, um, this is a good action, it's what you ought to do, but actually it makes people less happy? Well, in order to think about that, let's think about the objection of Thomas Carlyle. He raised this in a series of letters to John Stuart Mill during the 1830s. He basically said, utilitarianism is big philosophy. It is a philosophy fit for swine, and we mentioned this a little bit last time. Now, why is it pig philosophy? Because it identifies being good with feeling. What is the good? It's just feeling good. And he says, well, that's, that's a fine philosophy for pigs. What is it for a pig to be happy? Well, just to, you know, feel good in the market. The pig is there, has lots of mud to slop in, has lots of food to eat from the trough, has other cute little piggies to play with and come work with, and so on. <laughs> And you might think, that's all it is to be a happy pig, just to experience these pleasures. But are human beings like that? Is a human being such that there's nothing to being good except feeling good? And his answer is no. This is degrading the human beings. It's a degrading view of human nature. Now, Mill responds at first in these letters in the 1830s in a way that is different from his later response in the utilitarian. His first response is to say, Wait a minute, what is utilitarianism all about? It's about all of us feeling good, not just you feeling good. The whole idea is to maximize happiness for the entire community. And so that has two important implications. First of all, for you to be good is not just for you to feel good. It is for you to make everybody feel good, okay? It's really to promote the good of everyone. Now, how do you do it? First point is, actually, the best way of promoting the good of everyone is to promote your own good. Here, Mill is taking a page from Adam Smith. He's saying, when are you actually doing what you can to maximize the good of the community? Most of the time, it's when you're looking out for your own. Tend your own garden. Okay? After all, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, are they doing what they do because they're charitable and have their eye on the good of the whole? No, they're doing it to maximize their own good. And yet, if everybody does that, Adam Smith held in the Wealth of Nations, we will, in general, maximize the good of everyone. The theorem that goes along with that, proven, didn't appear until I think it was 1954 in the work of Arrow and the Grove, but in general, that's right. If each person tends to their own and maximizes their own good and makes decisions on that basis, in general, given that certain constraints are satisfied, that will maximize the good of the whole. So the first thing Bill says is, well, look, yeah, we're trying to maximize the good for everybody. Most of the time, you can do that by just looking out for yourself. It is fine most of the time to think primarily about yourself. You're the main one being a good. But he says, there's another important point. I have reason to develop my own capacities, my own intelligence, my own virtue, my own higher qualities. Why? Because they benefit other people. They don't just benefit. So if I work hard, for example, I benefit from my working hard, but so do other people. If I become a virtuous person, if I am, for example, honest, if I'm courageous, if I'm generous toward others, that benefits other people too. It doesn't just benefit me. So if I actually want to be the kind of person who maximizes the good for humanity, 
I'm going to be the sort of person who develops virtues, who develops my higher faculties, who works hard. And so, and so Bill says, look, if I'm really interested in maximizing the welfare of all, I'm not going to be rolling around in the mud like a pig. <laughs> I'm instead going to be doing all these things. I'm going to look like a good person, traditionally conceived. I'm going to try to develop my faculties. I'm going to try to develop my virtues, etc. Now, in utilitarianism, he does retain those arguments, but he adds and emphasizes the different arguments. It wasn't there earlier. He says, pleasures differ in quality as well as in quality. Now, Bentham had recognized there were different kinds of pleasures, and he has an extensive catalog of the different kinds and the sub-kinds and all of that. But Mill says, yes, that's true, there are different kinds of pleasures. But it's not just that there are different kinds, they actually differ in value. And so they differ in quality as well as quantity. He says, it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. Why? Because we're capable of better pleasures than pigs are. Mill asks us to entertain the following. Suppose, <laughs> I'll, I'll update this a little bit. Suppose you have a chance to trade in a certain amount of your intelligence. After all, people spend a lot of time on SAT prep classes, on other things to try to get their kids into top ranked schools and all that. Well, suppose that it, you're not interested in that, but you could, there's quite a market out there for extra intelligence. And suppose we had some way of actually transferring a bit of your intelligence to somebody else. So, there's a company that sells IQ. And it basically says, yeah, we'll plug you into the machine, we'll take some of your intelligence, we'll transfer it to somebody else for a hefty fee. So let's say we pay you a certain amount of money, and you'll become a lot dumb. We'll knock you down, let's say, I don't know, what's a good one? Two standard deviations. You'll lose 30 points on your IQ. Now, some of you might say, ah, no problem, I got so much. <laughs> no one will notice. <laughs> But, but I mean, that's a lot, right? And so you might think, okay, shoot, I'll give up 30, but now we say, look, I realize this is worth a lot of money. And so we'll make sure that the rest of your life is very happy. We'll give you a good job that you can actually do in your limited IQ. Um, we'll make sure you have a good income. We'll match you up with other low IQ people so that you will actually be able to have a wonderful family of dummies. Uh, anyway. Suppose we could do, how many of you would say, oh yeah, I'd make that trade. After all, keep those IQ points, things might work out well, they might not. But here it's like, well, we're guaranteed, you'll be happy with your life, even though you've lost those, those 30 IQ points. How many of you would say, yeah, I'll do it? <laughs> all right, that, that, that's interesting, about five or six of you. Uh, there are always like a couple of guys in the back who are willing to do this, usually they're not my TAs. Uh, but anyway, yes, I mean, <laughs> uh, some people might be willing to do it, but John Stuart Mill says almost nobody. In fact, nobody who's remotely satisfied with their life would be willing to do this. And why? It's because the pleasures that a person who is more intelligent can experience are better pleasures. Here's another way of thinking about it, even more extreme. Suppose I said, we'll turn you into a pig. Imagine. Imagine that my wife is a wicked witch. <laughs> and she can turn you into a pig, but we'll make sure you're a super happy pig. I mean, not one of those that's about to be squatted for pork chops, but, you know, a pig on some preserve where you get to run around and just be a super happy pig. Um, will you do it? Will you say, yeah, I'll be a pig if I get to be a super happy pig? Uh, Mill says, no, no one in the right mind is going to do that. Now, why? Well, we are capable of better pleasures, not just a different kind of pleasure, but a better, better pleasure, a higher quality pleasure than pigs are. Well, what does it mean for one pleasure to be higher quality? And how do we know whether one pleasure is higher quality than another? He says, well, we've got to see what the competent judges prefer. Here it is, milled together with his wife, Harriet Taylor. <laughs> and the thought is, they're competent judges, they'll tell you. Now, who is competent to judge? Well, those with experience of both. Those who have experience of piggy pleasures and also experience of characteristically human pleasures. The higher quality pleasure and the lower quality pleasure. We don't just go to people who don't know anything about these higher quality ones and ask them. But neither do we go to the people who are immersed in the higher qualities and have never experienced the other kind. We want to ask people who have experience of both kinds of pleasures, which is better. 
And those people, if they agree, are going to tell us which is higher. Now, often they won't really agree. Um, when I was in graduate school, two of my professors had this long argument about which is better, ballet or baseball. And they couldn't agree. One said, but ballet, you know, beautiful music, beautiful dance. They're combined and tell a story. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and, and the other said, yeah, but baseball. I mean, people hit things. <laughs> and you never know who's going to win. I mean, you watch Swan Lake, and it's like it always happens more or less the same way, and the same thing happens in the end. But you watch the Pirates play the Phillies, it's different every time. And so, come on, I mean, baseball, well, anyway, this argument went back and forth. So presumably, the competent judges, and both of them liked baseball and liked ballet, but they didn't agree about it. That tells us, no one said, those are roughly at the same level of quality if the competent judges don't agree. But competent judges might agree. Suppose people have experience of, well, let's see, <laughs> people who are fond of baseball, what else would they typically have experience of? Yeah. Beer, okay. <laughs> so we say, okay, baseball or beer? You can watch the game, but no beer. Or you can have a beer, but no game. Which will you choose? Now, I don't know. <laughs> what would baseball fans choose? Baseball with no beer or beer? I kind of want to know who's playing and what kind of beer. <laughs> um, I, that, that reminds me of a great movie scene, very touching movie scene. Have you ever seen Almost Famous? Anyway, there's a, there's a girl who's groupie for this band, and they end up trading her away, basically in a poker game, and they lose, so she has to go off and be the groupie for this other band for two weeks or something. And she, she's crying as she hears from the, the, like the main character that she's been traded away for a case of beer. And her response as she's crying is, what kind of beer? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that, actually, that's a really good illustration. It's also really sad. Now, you might think, look, competent people <laughs> will normally, almost all, go for certain things given certain kinds of choices. And that's an indicator of quality. Now, how does Mill think it's going to come out? He thinks the best pleasures are going to be intellectual pleasures. Okay, the pleasures of, for example, getting a new idea. There is Archimedes in his bathroom. Shouting, you're reading. <laughs> okay? Or, you know, reading something really gripping and really good. Uh, learning something new. Intellectual pleasures, he says, are the best kinds of pleasures. The second kind, intermediate kind, are social pleasures. The pleasures of French, of love, of, you know, being around other people and interacting with them in good ways. And the lower kind, still pleasure, still valuable, but the lower kind are sensual pleasures. Okay, it's lying on the beach, drinking a corona. Now, is he right that the competent judges would prefer the intellectual pleasures? Let's find out. You're students at the University of Texas at Austin. Surely you are well acquainted with intellectual pleasures, but also with social pleasures, also with sensual pleasures. So now, I'm going to treat you all as competent judges, and I'm going to ask you about the following. Suppose we have a contest to determine who does best in this course on the quizzes overall, and we offer three potential prizes to the winner. First potential prize is the high point of sensual pleasures. It will be an all-expense-paid weekend, anywhere in the world you want to go, with anyone you want to be with. And if that person is not willing to go, no problem. We'll drug them so they'll follow everything. <laughs> okay? Now, forget the moral qualms about that at the moment. Um, that's option one. Option two is the height of social pleasures. We'll gather all your friends together. We'll bring them all here to Austin. You can have a weekend of having fun, all schoolwork you'll be excused from for that, for that weekend. You can just hang out with these friends and have a great time. And then, the height of intellectual pleasures. An entire weekend, all expenses paid, in the Perry Costanieto. <laughs> <laughs> now, which do you choose? How many say, the library, the library? <laughs> so, all right, one guy. Yes, good work. Actually, I do too. <laughs> What about the social players? Um, what about the sensual players? <laughs> no, that looks like exactly the inverse of the ranking that John Stewart will have in mind. So how do we explain this? 
Mill himself says, look, I admit people don't always make these choices. Some people lose their ability. Some people never have the ability to appreciate the higher pleasures. There's another possible explanation, Plato's, where there's a sort of balance of the soul that's required. And the way you write these really depends on your particular balance at a certain time. Right now you're in college, we're force feeding you intellectual pleasures. We're basically pulling open your mouth and just stuffing them in there. Say, come on, consume these intellectual pleasures. <laughs> <laughs> like you're getting plenty of those, so the weekend in the PCL doesn't sound that great. But, you know, the others are being shortchanged a bit. If you had spent the last 20 years in a brothel, you might think, yeah, we can do the library, sounds awesome. <laughs> anyway, so that's part of the explanation, maybe. But maybe I've skewed this by not really giving you a very good test of the highest pleasures. After all, is a weekend in the library really the highest sort of intellectual pleasure? Suppose I could say, instead of that, a weekend of being able to perform a sort of Vulcan mind belt, if you will, with the mind of God. You can know anything you want to know, okay? Anything you want explained will be explained to you. And if you don't believe in God, we'll say, somehow we'll make your mind in tune with the universe in such a way that just any question you have will be answered, and will be answered correctly. I mean, not just like, what's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? 42. <laughs> but I mean, really, answered, you know, in a, it would good answer. Now, in that case, what would you choose? That seems a lot more appealing then, right? So, in any, I mean, I tend to think so. Of, like, look at all the publications I could get from that one. Week. <laughs> so, anyhow, there are complicated questions here about how to rank these pleasures, even if Mill's right. But now there are additional problems. What about complex pleasures? For example, here, the idea is with a first kiss. Yes, that's a sensual pleasure, but it's also a social pleasure. Um, and it's presumably all sorts of thoughts go along with that. So actually, it's a very complex sort of experience. How do we take apart its various components, and how do we decide where to put that in the rank? Or often, let's say you're in a class, and yes, you get a really good idea. There's an intellectual pleasure that goes along with that. But often, it, there's a sort of whole experience there, and the other parts of the setting that are contributing to that too. Even that tends to be a complex play. What about aesthetic pleasure? This is one type that Bentham talks about, the pleasure of a beautiful sunset, of looking at a beautiful painting, uh, of hearing a beautiful piece of music. Those kinds of aesthetic pleasures, where do they rank? Are they higher than or lower? Is that kind of sensual pleasure? Uh, Mill sometimes acts as if it is, but that's a pretty degrading view of art. Or is it an intellectual pleasure? And yet it seems to have a very large sensual component. What about kinesthetic pleasures, like the pleasure of playing tennis? That's something that can be enjoyable, movement can be enjoyable, and yet it's not exactly a sensual pleasure, is it? Or what is it exactly? I don't know. But sometimes just the pleasure of movement, the pleasure of exercising a skill, that's something that can be pleasurable too. Where do they go? Well, in any event, there are lots of questions we could raise about Mill's rough hierarchy here. He may or may not be right about that. But he does affirm those 1830s answers and say, look, virtue would be valuable to everybody, even if I'm wrong about that. Even if it doesn't pay off for you <laughs> to put on your intellectual side, for example, it pays off for everybody else. So it's something the utilitarian would certainly support. Those higher pleasures will tend to produce virtues, intellectual and moral, and those will benefit others. Now, there is a real disagreement here between Bentham and Hill. Often people describe it this way. They say, ah, for Bentham, it's just quantity. In fact, at one point, he famously said, all other things being equal, <laughs> quantities of pleasure being equal, pushpin is as good as poetry, where pushpin is this sort of kind of mindless game. Kind of, it's, people disagree about exactly what kind of game it is. Uh, but in any case, a common sort of game, think of it as being like Jenga or something like that, or like flipping poker cards into a hat or something of that sort. Um, but Bentham actually doesn't think quality doesn't matter at all. He does say, in notes that weren't published until after his death, in regard to well-being, quality as well as quality requires to be taken into account. So he actually agrees with Mill that some pleasures are higher quality than others. However, here's the difference. He thinks only you can really tell what's a higher quality pleasure for you. 
So Mill thinks we can gather the competent judges together and say in general for anyone that this kind of pleasure is a better pleasure than that. Bentham says, no, no, no. It's all individual. You like ballet better than baseball, then for you it's a higher quality of pleasure. You prefer baseball, then for you it, that's a higher quality of pleasure. You prefer the beer, then that's a higher quality of pleasure. For you, okay, we can say what's higher quality for you, what you intend to choose, but to say, oh, we're going to somehow gather competent judges together and figure out what's better for anyone, Bentham says, no, that's not right. Quantity depends on general sensibility. He thinks we all share that and can measure it through our But quality upon particular sensibility, on you preferring that kind of pleasure or that kind of pain to others. And so that's something he thinks is just individually relevant. We can't make any generalizations about it. And Bentham, moreover, says that's really important if we're to preserve people's liberty. Should I be able to decide what are the best pleasures for you? Should I be able to decide whether or not you're, you should be allowed to join a fraternity or a sorority, for example? Should I be allowed to decide whether you can drink beer, or whether you can go to the ballet, or go to baseball games, or blah, 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 what the proper activities for a student are? Bentham says, no, of course not. It's up to you. What do you enjoy doing? What are the better qualities of pleasures for you? That's something only you can really know. And nobody else has the right to tell you, aha, you're paying attention to lower quality pleasures. A friend suddenly starts going to roller derby. And you think, oh my god, that's a low quality pleasure. <laughs> but Bentham would say, hey, listen, maybe you find a low quality pleasure. Maybe that person really enjoys it. And so actually, you can't make any generalizations about this. Everybody is the, a better judge of what produces their own happiness than anybody else could be. Now, Mill agrees with him that liberty is in general better, that we should allow people to choose, but for a different sort of reason. He says there are certain actions that primarily just affect me. Those called self-regarding actions. And those I should be allowed to do as I please. However, when I affect other people, and in particular, when I'm in danger of harming other people, then maybe we would be justified in restricting your liberty. So he says the only justification for restricting liberty is harm to other people. But that's a different way of thinking about this. For Bentham, it's because I have no way of telling you what's the better way for you to live. Mill thinks, well, I could, but I really shouldn't. <laughs> OK. Well, there are various objections that uh, Mill responds to in utilitarianism. For example, the question of time. Won't we end up spending much of our lives calculating? After all, that oral calculus is complicated. My friend says, hey, what a Go out and get some coffee with me after class. You say, I don't know, I've got to do a calculation. Who might be affected? <laughs> you, me, the barista, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then, uh, give me some, I'll tell you, I'll get back to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> There's a real danger of that. And it's not just a sort of silly philosophical danger, it's a real danger. Think about committees. In any organization, people appoint committees to make decisions. And when does the committee actually have enough information to decide? When do they recommend that there be another committee? I, as it happens, am on a bunch of university and college level committees. And sometimes they do things and they're really effective and they make decisions in a short period of time. Other times, nothing happens. For an entire year, people study something and then at the end they say, well, we recommend that next year's committee take this question up again. <laughs> and so this question of when you've thought enough about it, when you're ready to decide and when you're not and need to do more study, that's actually a really important question and sometimes you do have to calculate about that. All right. Well, one more divide between different kinds of utilitarianism. What is the status of certain rules? After all, in utilitarianism, in a sense, there's only one rule, which is the principle of utility. Acts are right in proportion to their tendency to promote happiness. But now, we might say, well, what about ordinary moral rules? I mean, that's not what I learned as a child. You know, I'm going off to kindergarten, let's say. And what does mom tell me? Does she say, all right, acts are right in proportion to their tendency to promote happiness. So I want you to think every day, how can I maximize the utility of my fellow kindergartners? Um, probably not, unless it was Mrs. Mill. <laughs> uh, and so what, in fact, were you told? What are some basic common sense moral rules? Yeah. Good, treat others how you want to be treated. Good, share with other people, care about other people. Yeah. Don't tell lies. Don't tell lies. When 
your moms and dads didn't tell you very much today. But anyway, those are good things to be told. <laughs> now, that's something that Mill would say. Of course, those are important parts of it, morality. I'm not saying just teach kindergartners the principle of utility. Those things matter. He calls them secondary principles. And he says, really, in practice, we are going to need all sorts of secondary principles like that to be able to decide what is the best option. So he's saying, look, I'm telling you in the end what makes a right action right, what makes a wrong action wrong, what makes one action better than another. But I'm not saying you should go around throughout most of your life and think about this and do these calculations. Normally, we justify our actions and make decisions on the basis of these secondary principles. Things like treat others as you'd like to be treated, care about people, share with people, don't tell lies. We justify those rules by utility. Okay, we say don't lie. Why is that a good moral rule? Mill says, in general, lies are going to decrease happiness. Telling the truth is going to increase happiness. And so that's why that's a good rule. Murder. Murder is something we count as wrong. Why? Because if people go around killing other people, that decreases the general level of happiness. It promotes happiness to try to discourage murder. And so we appeal to the principle of utility only when these things conflict. Well, it does mean the principle of utility plays two roles here. First of all, it does justify these secondary principles, these common sense moral rules. And they serve as the practical test for morality. But second, it resolves conflicts between. Remember that argument in mental. Why you really need the principle of utility is you need to be able to resolve conflicts. And both Bentham and Mill say conflicts are an important feature of our moral life. We have these rules that come into conflict with other rules. For example, don't tell lies. Great moral rule. But are there occasions where it is actually justifiable to tell a lie? Yes. Give me an example of one. Yeah. If a stranger asks you where you live. Good. A stranger asks you where you live. Okay? Uh, might be a good occasion for telling a lie. Uh, now. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, why? What's wrong with telling strangers where you live? Bad things might happen, right? And so Mill would say, yeah, that's a case where there can be an exception, where we have a conflict between self-preservation and honesty, and you decide you better tell a lie because you might be putting yourself in danger if you tell the truth. So in that case, he would say there's a conflict between two principles, protect yourself, but also don't tell lies, and we decide what to do on the basis of the likely outcome. Not just for you, but for everyone involved. Okay? And in those cases, we say, all right, that kind of lie could be justified. Can you think of other moral rules that have exceptions in that one? Yeah? Another moral rule, uh, I was going to do an example, an example of when you might lie. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, it's uh, like a few other things in stress or something like that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, how do I look in this dress? Uh, dangerous question, guys. <laughs> Very dangerous question. Um, basically, yeah, this might be an occasion where it is wise to lie. <laughs> okay, why? For the sake of happiness. Okay, that's the point that Mill and Bentham are making. We decide whether or not to lie in those cases because we're thinking about overall levels of happiness. And sometimes it would be the right thing, sometimes you really ought to say it. No, 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 that, that's all wrong. Don't, don't wear that dress, you know? And how, it's a question of what in the end promotes the most happiness. And so there are going to be exceptions. W.D. Ross lists a bunch of principles, and we're, it's getting late, I don't want to go through all these individually, but you could think in terms of all of those as being good moral principles, but on the other hand, as having exceptions. There are times when you have to hurt others. There are times when you really shouldn't worry about improving yourself or you don't help others. There might even be times where you have to be unjust based on the general happiness. Yeah? So, would one of the exceptions be like torturing somebody to get information so they don't are like the same Good, okay, excellent example. Uh, suppose, you know, a uh, case from 24. This guy is the only one who knows where the nuclear bomb in Los Angeles is located. And you're Jack Bauer. Agent who has to try to somehow get this information in the next 15 minutes. And what do you do? You sit there and break his fingers one by one, okay, until he talks. 
And that might be a case where, look, you're treating that guy pretty unjustly. You might say, in general, torture is morally wrong. But still, in that occasion, for the sake of happiness, you have to do it. All right, next time, we'll start talking about more general epistemological and metaphysical questions.